An uninsulated vessel contains a movable piston. So we've got a diagram here that shows this piston. Vessel contains air on one side, initially at 1000 degrees Kelvin and 200 kPa, and carbon dioxide on the other, initially at 500 K and 400 kilopascals. Initially, the vessel is divided into two equal volumes, 0 0.01 cubic meters each. The surroundings are at 300 Kelvin. A piston is released and the system eventually comes to equilibrium. Determine the heat transfer between the vessel and the surroundings. Determine the final pressure of the air. And we're given the universal gas constant there. So we'll start off with our given information. And what I'd suggest is we make use of the diagram we've already been given here. But just summarize some of the information given in the problem on the diagram. So we're on the air side here. We're told that the initial pressure is 200 kPa and the initial temperature is 1000 K and also the initial volume is 0 0.01 cubic meters. So put those all on there. Over on the CO2 side, the initial pressure is 400 kilopascals. Initial temperature is 500 K and the initial volume is also 0 0.01 cubic meters. So those are all initial conditions either of the air or of the CO2 and the surroundings here are at 300 Kelvin. So that tells us that both of these gases are going to end up at 300 Kelvin because it asks determine the heat transfer between the vessel and the surroundings once equilibrium has been reached. Okay, So temperature at both sides is going to eventually reach 300 Kelvin because this is an uninsulated vessel. Now of course this piston is also free to move, right? Because it says the piston is released. So the piston is free to move and there's heat transfer with the surroundings. So that's all of the conditions that we know both at the beginning and at the end. So what have we been asked to find? First, we've been asked to find the heat transfer with the surroundings. Okay. Second, we've been asked to find the final pressure of the air. So P2 for the air. Notice right now the only thing we know about the air is its final temperature, so we certainly can't solve for that just yet. So our list of assumptions We'll start and we'll leave that aside. We'll start our analysis here. And first thing we are looking for here is the heat transfer with the surroundings. So let's think about our control volume here. I'm going to choose a control volume or a system that includes this entire container. Okay? Because we're looking for the heat transfer between the vessel and the surroundings. So we want the entire vessel to be inside of our control volume. So for part A, we'll begin by saying Q minus W is equal to delta U. And of course, this is a closed system because there's no mass flowing across that control volume that we chose. So think about all the terms in here. It's an uninsulated vessel, so there's certainly heat transfer with the surroundings. That's what we're trying to find. However, the work transfer with the surroundings is zero because there's nowhere where this thing is doing work on the surroundings or vice versa. So we can go here and we can say that there's no work transfer. And that also means that term is zero in the energy equation. So the heat transfer is just delta U. But we have to remember that this is the total internal energy for the entire system. And this particular system is made up of two parts, an air part and a carbon dioxide part. So we need to split this into two parts one for the air and one for the carbon dioxide. We also need to remember this is capital U, which is mass times the specific internal energy. So I'm going to write that as well. So we have the mass of the air times small u2 minus u1 for the air, so the subscript A just means air, plus the mass of the CO2 times u2 minus u1 for the CO2. So total internal energy is the sum 
of the contributions of the two internal energies. So, take a look at this. First thing we're going to do is calculate these two masses. And we know we can do that because we know the pressure, temperature, and volume of each of them. So we should be able to calculate those two masses right away. So that's what we'll do here. The mass of the air is PV over RT of the air. And we're doing this all at state 1 because we know all the properties we need there. So pressure is 200 kPa. Volume is 0 0.01 meters cubed. The gas constant is the universal gas constant, 8.314, divided by the molecular weight of air, 28.97. And those together will give us units of kilojoules per kilogram degree Kelvin. And then the temperature of the air is 1,000 degrees Kelvin. And we work all that out. It gives units of kilograms. And the mass of the air is 0 0.0069690 kilograms. Exactly the same thing now with the CO2. So PV over RT of the CO2. And again, this is done at the initial state because that's where we know properties. 400 kilopascals. Same volume, initially at least. Gas constant. Again, universal gas constant divided by the molecular weight of CO2, which you can get out of table A1, same place as we got this one. And that's 44.01. And those together give us units of kilojoules per kilogram degree Kelvin. And then finally the temperature is 500 Kelvin. So mass is 0 0.042348 kilograms. So we've got these two masses. Now we can turn our attention to these internal energies. And the first pair of internal energies here is for air. So we'll go to table A22. And notice we're going to be able to get both of these internal energies because the only thing we need to know is the temperature. Internal energy is only a function of temperature for ideal gases. So notice we've already used the ideal gas law and we're about to use ideal gas tables. So in our assumptions list here, we should note that these are both air and CO2 are ideal gases. Notice the other thing we should have written down here. We have the first law here with delta U on the right hand side, which means that we've neglected kinetic and potential energy. Okay? So back to getting our internal energies. Table A22 for air tells us that at T1 of 1000 degrees Kelvin, U1 is equal to 758.94 kilojoules per kilogram. And at T2 of 300 Kelvin, remember it ends up at the same temperature as the surroundings, U2 is equal to 214.07 kilojoules per kilogram. So that's for the air. Carbon dioxide we go to table A23 and again at 500 degrees Kelvin for the carbon dioxide we go to table A23 and the initial temperature is 500 degrees Kelvin the initial internal energy is 13,521 and this is kilojoules per kilomole. That's why we have the bar over top of here. At the final temperature of 300 Kelvin, 
U2 bar reduces to 69.39 kilojoules per kilomole. So we'll need to convert these molar values to mass values when we substitute them into the equation. So that's what we're ready to do now. Go back to our first law. Q is equal to the mass of air, 0 0.006969. Kilograms. Change in internal energy of the air, 214.07 minus 758.94. Those are both kilojoules per kilogram. Plus the mass of the CO2, 0.042348. Kilograms. The change in internal energy, 69.39 minus 13521. But those are both kilojoules per kilomole. So we need to also convert the kilomoles to kilograms. And for CO2, that's 44.01 kilograms per kilomole. Okay? So these units together will give us kilojoules per kilogram because the kilomoles cancel. So our units are okay there. And this Q works out to negative 10.1 kilojoules. So notice this number is negative and that certainly makes sense because both of these gases are hotter than the surroundings so the heat transfer is out of the system which according to our sign convention is negative. So that's the total amount of heat transfer. Part B, we're asked to get the final pressure of the air. P2 of the air. So if we take a look at this, go back to our given information. The only thing we know right now about the air at its final state is its temperature, is 300 Kelvin. Now, we also know that its initial volume is 0 0.01 cubic meters, but this piston is free to move, so the final volume is not that. But we need to figure out what the final volume is. Well, at the final state, the temperature of the air equals the temperature of the carbon dioxide, because they've both come into equilibrium with the surroundings, but of course because this piston is free to move, the pressure of the air also equals the pressure of the carbon dioxide. So the temperature and the pressure of the carbon dioxide in the air are the same at the end. So let's see if we can make use of that to figure out something about the volume of the air at the end. So at the final state, pressure of the air equals the pressure of the carbon dioxide. That's because of the movable piston. And the temperature of the air equals the temperature of the carbon dioxide. And that's because they both come to equilibrium with the surroundings at 300 K. So the ideal gas law then tells us that MR over V of the air must equal MR over V of the CO2 because the pressure and the temperature are the same. So we can figure out the relative volumes of the air and the CO2 from this. So that's going to be MR of the air divided by MR of the CO2. And we know all of these things. So the masses, first of all, mass of the air, 0 0.0069, 690 divided by the mass of CO2, 0 0.042348. So that's the mass of the air divided by the mass of CO2, and then the same thing for the gas constant. So I'll show the universal gas constant here, divided by molecular weight of air. So that's R of air, and R of CO2 is the same thing, but a different molecular weight. So that's the ratios of M's, and that's the ratios of R's. So V air works out to be 0.25 VCO2. So the final volume of the air is a quarter 
of the final volume of CO2. So if we go back to our diagram here, it turns out this piston moves in this direction. So the final volume of the air here is only a quarter of the volume of the CO2. So now we know something, okay, about the final volumes. But what we really need to know is the actual final volume of the air. So we need to remember that the volume of the air plus the volume of CO2 always has to add up to the same thing. Because the piston's moving, but the total volume remains constant. So this is 0 0.02 meters cubed. Remember the initial volume of each side is 0 0.01. So the total volume is 0 0.02. So we can substitute in here V air plus VCO2 is 4 V air. So V air is equal to 0 0.004 meters cubed. So now we can go to the ideal gas law. Pressure of the air is MRT over V of the air. And here we're talking the final conditions. So this is the mass of the air, which remember is constant the whole time. It's a closed system. So that's our mass. Our R, 8.314 divided by 28.97 kilojoules per kilogram degree Kelvin. And temperature, 300 Kelvin. And divided by the volume that we just solved for. So all of that tells us that our final pressure for the air is equal to 150 kilopascals.